background, as Indian Yang said, is actually in cognitive science and linguistics, and then I went to Yingli Evolution, and now I'm doing archaeology. So what I try to do in my work is combine all of these strands um, to do what I call uh, probably uh, something like paleolithic cognitive science. Um, and that approach is uh, basically trying to find out what these prehistoric people were thinking, how their minds were working. So it's really uh, kind of the other side of what we've been seeing today, um, trying to look more at the behavior. So, yes. Um, so as you can see, humans and uh, dinosaurs were coexisting. Uh, this is a very reliable source here from some creationist website. Um, you know, when the humans were riding on top of dinosaurs, uh, they also made art. <laughs> so um, I'm really not going to be talking about any of this. Um, <laughs> just to show you that there are things out there that actually we do really need to promote science uh, and, and the truth of science. Um, so this is a really great meeting, and the more we can uh, bring science to the public, the better it is. Right, so uh, I'll come on with just um, talking about the hand, because my specialty is laterality and handedness, and today I'll talk a lot about handedness. And if you look at the human uh, development, we actually see that the, um, the hands are a very important thing. They develop very early. Um, Jacqueline Fagat has been doing work on, on laterality in, uh, in very early development and she actually, she used, she's now saying that probably um, there's something even in the embryo that's causing laterality, but this is work um, to be followed, so it's quite exciting. But when we look at how the, the um, hands develop, uh, this work by uh, Peter Hepper was working on the thumb sucking, and actually a fetal thumb sucking <coughs> hand is an excellent predictor of hand preference at age 12. So it seems like there's uh, something really uh, special here going on. <coughs> Moving forward, um, neonates, uh, they have a preference to turn the head towards the right um, at birth. And this is probably related to something to do also with this laterality, and it, this probably reinforces the right hand preference that you find in these infants. <coughs> and then you get on to starting to look at motor skills and how the, the hands are working together, and I'll come back to this point later on. But the uh, development of manual skill is, uh, in my view, quite important, um, also evolutionarily. And I'll also come back to that at the end of my talk. In particular, by manual collaboration. And as the child develops their skill, the, the hand preference will increase until you get to um, you know, something where they, they have a, a really strong hand and um, they've got quite a high level of skill. I think for this one, I need to go out. So go here. So this is just showing a, a one-year-old child. Right there. The Swiss chard. So this shows how a hand preference can be really established very early on. or 
baskets or whatever, um, there's always this uh, pattern where the right hand is doing a little more manipulative um, function. So I'll get on to sort of what I'm going to talk about now. Um, this is the structure of the talk. I'll just really quickly go over some material evidence. Um, then I'll talk about apes. Then I'll talk about the brain. And I'll finish with uh, some of my thoughts on language and cultural uh, behaviors. And so I'd be happy for any comments or critiques. So the material evidence. Um, I'll just talk about the direct forms of evidence that we have. The indirect things are sort of, they're not exactly evidence. I think they're more parallels that we can look at. So osteology and archaeology are what we have at the moment. And I'm going to start from the present day and work backwards in time, going down into deep time, as we call it. And this chart is just showing the range of data that we have available or not available. So in many cases, we don't have any uh, postcranial remains. We don't have any paired arm bones. So we can't actually uh, get any information from those species. And actually, this chart is not even up to date because the Denisovans aren't even in there. Uh, but this is always changing. But that's the general picture. So we have all these hominins. Um, and we're going to try and find out what happened with their handedness. This is just a, another um, way to show the, the relationships. Uh, the reason I'm showing that is because, yeah. So I'm going to start from the top and go down. So in the very recent times, we've got modern Homo sapiens here, um, and we find the very modern proportions of right-handers in these populations. For, for example, in the hand stencils, so these were painted <coughs> on case, and it was done either by spraying directly from the mouth or with a system of two tubes. And um, this is an Aboriginal style. Uh, we do find tubes in the archaeological record that are filled with ochre, but we're not sure if that, that's how they were done. But anyway, this is a method. Um, it's quite a lot more difficult to do. Um, but you have to keep in mind, if you spray from the mouth, you actually you have the pigment and probably you end up swallowing some of it. With red ochre, it's fine, or yellow ochre, charcoal, it would be OK. But with manganese powder, for example, it's highly toxic. So you wouldn't want to be uh, mouth spraying with that. But we do find, if we look at uh, all these sites that have naked hand stencils, we find really interesting proportions. They're about the same around the world and through time. We find that about a, a one third right hand stencil and two thirds left hand stencil. Now, why should it be that way around? Well, in the experiments that people do, it seems that uh, right handed people prefer to put their left hand against the wall. And we're not sure if that's related to some kind of postural bias to stand with the left foot. More work needs to be done on that. But in any case, the pattern we see in the uh, archaeological record matches the right-handed uh, frequency of today. So we can confirm that these homo sapiens were right-handed. So that's, that's expected. That's just a nice confirmation. And moving down to, to Neanderthals, for example, they had, their tools were worn on one side. So you can, you can actually tell which hand was using the tool based on the way it was worn down. And these tools were used to uh, work uh, leather, hide, uh, wood, and so on. Um, of course, we have the endo tasks. I don't need to say any more about those. Um, the, the woodworking I mentioned, again, is tool asymmetrical use wear on tools. And uh, these were probably for making spears, because we know that the Neanderthals uh, possibly hunting with spears, and especially uh, with a thrusting movement, not necessarily throwing, but thrusting, and that's related to the brain, um, sorry, the skeletal <coughs> asymmetry. We also have data from the teeth. Um, so these, the, this is work that's going on here, actually, here in Burgos and Tarragona. Um, and 
So he, the direction of these diagonal marks tells you which hand the person was using. Now the only question is, if, do we know what, what was causing these marks? We know they were not dietary, so they were definitely made by tools. They were made by, um, obviously, lithic tools because there was no bamboo in probably Europe at that time, I suppose. Um, but the tools were consistent with the thick cut marks. And we do have ethnographic parallels. So these places are all examples with um, this cutting meat from the mouth like this has been um, described and documented. And there's even a video clip. I don't have it here, but um, it still exists today. And this guy's got a massive, I don't know if you can see it, he's got a huge chopping knife and he's just slicing it really quickly past his, his um, nose. And um, so you can imagine if uh, with lithic tools that there would be a little bit of um, a contact with the teeth. <coughs> so I've summarized the data that have been published so far and we have um, 84% right-handers among the Amitals and hyperdenses. So that's exactly within the, the modern uh, human percentage, 85%, that's the classic proportion of right-handedness. And if we move back to hydrogensis, we have uh, a few examples here and there in the record. So this is just one single instance where somebody made a stone tool and they left the scatter that showed they were sitting on the ground in the same way as a right-handed person. And at the site of Boxgrove, actually, they were um, doing a lot of butchering. They were actually butchering meat, and they brought like elephants and things. They made the stone tools right on, right next to it, probably when they found it, um, and butchered it, and resharpened their tools and reused them. So this is really, you can really see that there was, a, there was a single um, activity of making a tool that happened. So in this case, we can be fairly confident that it was an individual who made this scatter. And that person was right-handed. And the teeth, actually, from Boxgrove, there are two teeth that also have these striations that were also right-handed. And this is the last of the skeletal data, actually. It's homorectus, homorgaster. Um, it's also a single individual. He might be pathological, um, but in any case, he's compatible with a right-handed uh, bias. And that's because of the, uh, the asymmetrical use of the skeleton, of the muscles, affects the skeleton. So you see a more robust right side. And tennis players have a really extreme variant of this. Um, which is actually the, the um, asymmetry that we find in modern tennis players is <coughs> on a level of what we find in Neanderthals. So we, today, office workers, we have a, a really symmetrical skeletons. Um, the Neanderthals were very asymmetrical, they, and which you only find in things like tennis players, which is an extreme level throughout the lifetime that are causing these changes. So that's why the, the hypothesis about spear thrusting hunting was developed because that's really physical, it would have been constant throughout um, the life. So that was an overview of the data. So as you can see, we, we really don't have much information. Um, but what we can say is that the Neanderthals were very clearly right-handed as a species. Um, <coughs> moving on to sort of living apes. So we've got 85, 85 to 90 humans, 85 Neanderthals. The other apes, um, we don't have much data from orangutans or gorillas or bonobos simply because they're so highly endangered that there are hardly any of them left and it's hard to study them. So they're, they're all dying off. Um, the chimpanzees are the best studied and even there we don't find a proportion of um, group level handedness that reaches the human level. So there's really uh, something that's a more extreme happening in humans. And so in order to kind of find out uh, 
you know, what's happened along this line? Something has happened along this line in human evolution to cause our very extreme bias. So I just have a video clip here from the chimpanzees uh, just to show you how the, they can actually be uh, very individually handed. So there is, just, just like humans, chimpanzees will be right-handed or left-handed, and that's going to be through their lifetime. Uh, here's the video. This is not cracking. This is totally wild. And uh, this model here was 
proposed by Guillard, and it's quite appropriate because it says that the, the non-dominant hand is responsible for spatial positioning, low frequency movements, is supporting the plate, and the dominant hand is doing the finer manipulations, high frequency movements. And we do see that this model does apply to most daily activities. For example, um, in stone tool making. So the left hand is supporting the, the stone core. It's remembering the spatial location, positioning it at the right angle. The right hand is doing this very fast ballistic movement that doesn't have any visual feedback. And it's, it's, it's striking the core at, at within millimeters to get the right effect. So um, the exercise then was to try and uh, think about how this model could be connected with uh, language and the brain, which is always what I try to do. I try to connect everything together, even if it doesn't seem like it should be. So, uh, you know, people are using prehistoric right-handedness as a marker for language. And really, you know, this was Broca back in the 1860s who started proposing this connection. But actually, um, I, I'm not sure that there's, there is a connection. But to, to try and, and, and work through this and try and see if we can um, sort of um, articulate the connection between handedness and language, I've uh, drawn on the idea of this, this is this, the dual brain idea, which it's, it's a caricature, but actually it, it's, with the new data coming out, it's actually uh, quite appropriate, and it does seem to hold out in many different domains. And this is so the, the you know, functional uh, laterality of the brain. And so when you put this together with the uh, language models of language function, you find that really the, the faster right hand that I showed you before, it does deal with more uh, finer temporal and spatial scales in all different domains, memory, knowledge, manual, actual language. The right hemisphere, which is the left hand, it's um, dealing with coarser scales of resolution. So this is a sort of a, a model, putting everything together. And it does actually fit quite nicely with um, Tim Crow's torque model, um, which this actually accounts for Patelias. So, you know, however abstract this can be, I think you can um, you can use this as a starting point to look for um, neuroanatomical information and to try and get at this uh, connection between language and and handedness and stone tool making. We did some experiments with FTCD, so this is an ultrasound. Um, um, brain <coughs> technique. It's basically measuring the blood flow in the middle cerebral artery, which is uh, which is what feeds the Broca's area and all the interesting language areas and motor areas. So we basically uh, strap this headband onto people's heads and uh, ask them to make stone tools. And in this case, we ask for a shooting hand axes and. We also ask them to do a language task, which is a standard language task, which is word generation. So you give them a, a letter, and they have to think of words starting with that letter. I should mention, FTCD only gives you activation in one hemisphere or the other. So you, you can see whether the left hemisphere is more active than the right. But it, it has a really nice uh, time precision. So you can see the time course of the activation very well. So we wanted to compare the activation for the stone tool making and the language. And we found a, a really nice correlation. This is just um, all subjects pooled. Language is, at, as usual, on the left hemisphere. This is a very <coughs> typical response. The stone tool making, um, there was a sort of a rightward shift. But the main result that we found interesting was the correlation. So each individual subject had a uh, 
correlated strength and laterality for the two tasks. So that's just one more uh, piece of support for the connection between handedness, language, and stone tool making. And John Bradshaw's got a really nice sort of um, proposal of how this connection can be uh, manifested. He talks about sequencing and fine jungle order in the left hemisphere, which is basically for us um, possibly Broca's area, because that's responsible for sequencing. Um, people don't, this is kind of the most um, explicit description that you find in the literature. So I've been really struggling trying to find something a little bit more, uh, more better defined. So this is what we're working with at the moment. But for now, the results do seem to confirm that there's a connection. So I'll just um, finish off by talking about you know, some of our ideas that we've been having in, in the Liverpool um, about language and cultural behaviors. And we've been working in the Social Brain Project, and um, this has to do with increasing brain size. Um, the control of fire has been a really important feature of human evolution. And the idea is that the fire is a really, it's a social place where roots gather. Um, it also, <coughs> besides protecting you against predators and keeping you warm, it's also a place where you will, uh, in the evening after the sun goes down, groups gather around, they'll talk, they'll make tools, children will learn. So it's an extremely important place and time for the acquisition of these complex skills. And in, in modern hunter-gatherers, you find that the, the uh, evening fire time is extending the working day effectively of, of the human. So uh, we have these, our um, metabolism is, is not, no longer correlated with the daylight as it is in other apes. So we basically, our peak of activity is in the evening. All the other apes, they go to sleep when the sun goes down. So this, this social aspect um, seems to be really well facilitated by the control of fire. And we do find, so we have definite control of fire by uh, 0.4 million years, probably before. There's a use of fire much earlier, um, but we can't establish that they really uh, had full control of it at the time. And so we're kind of looking at, at all these different factors. And language here is somewhere in this line. But if you sort of combine all these factors, you would have to put, push language back too much earlier. So coming back to the evolution tree, um, just want to kind of <coughs> This time I'm going to go the other way around, so I'm going to start from deep time and move forward. I'm going to just um, tell you what I think are the earliest manifestations of cultural behaviors. Um, I'm not saying they're linguistic, but they're kind of the, the things that are strange, that, that humans and hominids have been doing. And um, so the, the current thinking is that the the last common ancestors were something like um, nutcracking, tool using, social living, social learning animals. Um, when you get to these earliest potential use of tools, um, butcher remarks, apparently these are still highly debated, but if you believe that these are stone tool which remarks. Then we have earliest tool use at 3.3 3 million. <coughs> now, it, it can be an uh, incidental tool. We don't know if, if the tools were made or found or whatever. That Shannon McFerrin was the illustrator of the image? Um, or just a, was it I'm not sure. I think probably it's attributed to. So. 
But he, he, but he is not the He was the, the author, main author of the okay. paper. Okay, but so the possibly painter. there was someone else who wasn't mentioned on the credits. Um, so we've got this, you know, it's, it shouldn't be surprising that they were using tools because they were already using tools. They were probably termite fishing and using digging sticks and all sorts of other things and shaking leaves and, and throwing things around. And this pebble, I have to show it because people don't really take it seriously, but it's, it was uh, definitely transported. So it somehow, it somehow got into the cave. Um, possibly, you know, it looks like a face. You can see faces anywhere. But the fact that you would see a face is probably something already human. So um, this is the, the earliest evidence that anyone has ever proposed to be any kind of cultural behavior. And we get to the definite tool use, um, tool making, actually. Arella um, <coughs> Hover thinks it really is a, 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 an essentially different innovation. Um, and she believes it really was a, a huge innovation. Um, I think probably it was um, definitely a, a, a tool using innovation because we find that they, they did already have this precision. They knew where exactly to hit the stone. They knew how to get what they wanted out of it. And from my experience with teaching students to make stone tools and also some experiments I've been doing on teaching students without language to make stone tools, we find that if you don't have this um, verbal instruction of, of concepts, that you really have no clue <laughs> how to do this. So for me, this is actually a um, really important innovation. And actually, the Pyrantheans are candidate species for the earliest stone um, tools. We must not forget that. Um, they were group living also. And uh, so, the, you know, in the time range, in the space, the geographic range that we have, they were candidates. We really don't know who were the first stone tool makers. But I want to zoom in here on this time period because I think this is where all the really interesting things happen. All the brain expansions going on, um, migrations out of Africa. There's huge changes going on. And I think that's really a crucial moment when things are happening. Yeah, so yeah, uh, migrations all around the world. And you know, when Hamar asked the, 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 the requirements for meat eating would have been much bigger, as we just heard from Jose um, about the brain. And so tools would have really been a, a huge help for this. But I think there's a second innovation that happened with the issuing. And that's not in terms of the uh, motor abilities to make stone tools, but it's more of a conceptual innovation. Because in the old one, you only, you're only making flakes. You're making flakes because you need a sharp edge to butcher your meat. In the Asturian, you really see the, the first evidence of an aesthetic appreciation. You have symmetry. It's not perfect symmetry, but it's near symmetry. And often it's offset symmetry. So you, you will find these uh, hand axes that have a, you know, a deliberate offset symmetry. One straight edge and one sort of curved edge. And this is a really recurring pattern. Um, and the work we've been doing in Liverpool, um, in Kilombe, in Kenya, is, is sort of, uh, looking at the variation you find in hand axes. This site is extremely rich in five faces. It's basically the, the floor is littered with hand axes, and you have to walk on them to get to the site. So it's a perfect chance for John Gallup here to study uh, allometry, which is what he's looking at in hand axes, how the size um, changes, the proportions change with the size of the hand axe. But in, in you know, this site, here you've got Homo erectus or something like that, uh, possibly making fire, um, doing something with these hand axes, 
it might have been a workshop or a training ground or some kind of gathering place where people used to make tools together because there were really literally like probably 30,000 or something pieces and that's just from the surface. There hasn't been um, really huge excavations yet. So this site is looking very promising and it's been very securely dated. So uh, 990 is the minimum. It's um, paleomagnetic dating. Uh, that's the sort of, sorry, I said minimum, I meant maximum age. So we're still working on the minimum age now, but there's a, a the horizon is, is really um, narrow, so that there's a, it was really finely constrained uh, layer. And here, the, the hand axes were made, um, you know, with these templates. John Gall, um he really believes that there's this uh, template that they're working from. Uh, we have the large cores, so they make large lengths, <coughs> and then they'll make their bifaces. And what's nice at this site is that we do find both the cores and the bifaces. So we have a series of cores, dozens of cores, large cores, from which were removed a large flake, one or two, sometimes two or three or four. And those were the blanks that were going to become hand axes. And then we do have the, the beautiful hand axes. They're in more or less good condition, but this is one that's just being pulled out of the ground on the surface, and the preservation is fantastic. So we can really see the difference between the, the, the cores that were serving as flight blanks and the hand axes that were really finely worked. So, um, yeah, so our thoughts uh, on learning language, the brain, and the hand. We can sort of try and pull everything together into uh, a model which I would call the declarative shift. This has to do with um, declarative memory. Um, it's about the, the conscious awareness that you have of your learning. And we can imagine that these, these guys were nothing, they were using a kind of visual spatial uh, form of, of what, mentalizing. Um, when you have language, you suddenly, you can start thinking about things in a different way. Um, and one really important um, factor that you can um, get from language is that when you're all alone doing your making your tools on the tundra, you can think and reflect on what you learned. And you can really um, consciously practice. You can practice, you can think about how you're improving and what you're doing. And that's this sort of, um, yeah, the, you can see this more manifest when you get to the more recent thing, uh, tools. This, this is the work of a master flint knapper. These people are very rare. They would have spent um, weeks making this. And they, you know, we think that they, this social structure was such that these people were able to sit in isolation and be fed and be cared for while they were working these tools. And they were possibly a form of a demonstration, possibly um, in private, but in any case, these were really um, special things that were being made. And I, I really think that you, you cannot get to this level of expertise unless you've got language. So this is the hypothesis. Uh, so really uh, pulling together all these, these things that I've been talking about. And the role of language is something that remains to be established. But I really think that with the, the data from the non-human primates, we see that um, task complexity does affect hand preference. So there, uh, the, the hypothesis is that the really complex uh, tool making and tool using skills that hominins were engaged in 
was um, facilitated by social learning, by symbolic and linguistic exchange of information. <coughs> And that's where it reinforced itself. So, you know, when you're living in a, in a kind of setting where you've got tools being made, being repaired, um, people all over the place, you have your social networks with the tribe over the hill, you've got to maintain these relationships. Um, you know, grandfather over here is making something from his childhood, and, and if the child next door will be learning, and the, this is the context for learning that we have. And we, we can see from the, the hunter-gatherers that there's always a concept of teaching. They always have, even if, they're, even if the teaching of skills is not verbal, there's a concept of active teaching. And I think that's really also specific to humans. I think that's my final slide. So uh, I'd just like to thank my sponsors, the Lucy to Language Project, the Lever Human Trust, which is funding me at the moment, and um, all the other bodies that have helped with my research, and Emiliano and Kitina for the invitations. So thanks for your attention.